The question in my mind is, how do you create or relaunch a highly profitable and successful six to seven figure business? With so much conflicting advice about the best ways to start and grow your business, how do you get it right the first time? I want to help entrepreneurs make a real difference and navigate the messy world of startup or relaunch. My name is John North, and this is the Startup Secrets for Entrepreneur Show. Join me today when we dig deep with our guests and get you the best blueprint so you can fast track your own business. This episode is sponsored by Volpreneur.app, your all-in-one online business system. Make sure you subscribe for future episodes at StartupSecrets.show right now. So let's get into the day's episode. You're listening to the Startup Secrets for Entrepreneurs show, and I'm your, special, your host, John North. My mission is to help entrepreneurs make a difference and navigate the messy world of startup and relaunch, or commonly known as a pivot. Join me today, and we dig deep with our guests, and we give you the best concepts and strategies to fast track your business. And my very special guest today is Noel Andrews, who's the founder of JobRack. So welcome, Noel, to the show. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Cool. So I had a little bit of digging into your website, and I sort of get a bit of an idea of, of what you're up to. Um, but give me a little bit of an idea of, of sort of where you came from in terms of um, your background. Are you, did you, I'm guessing you didn't end up doing this from the get-go. Some, it's probably most people are accidental, right, when they get to this point. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, with, with kind of a few kind of wobbles along the way. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, a little bit about me. So I'm based in London. Uh, kind of I've got a bit of a uh, kind of an addiction to rooftop bars, uh, and London's a great place to be for that. Nice. Uh, like my water sports and uh, – yeah, loving kind of the, just kind of there's some really, really great vibes and great people uh, here in London. So, uh, yeah, liking it here. Um, work wise. So entrepreneurial from a young age, um, usual kind of car washing, mowing lawns, things like that. I was big into aviation and planes. And so I did a little bit of plane washing, uh, small planes, but still uh, a little bit different than, than your average. I um, and and then I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, um, I went into a kind of corporate IT uh, effectively after kind of university. Um, very much into kind of project management and mm-hmm. uh, kind of just getting stuck in making things happen uh, for airlines primarily. And it's kind of 15 years through a variety of leadership roles with lots of kind of managing, interviewing, hiring, you know, or everything that kind of goes with that in the corporate world. And but always had this little kind of entrepreneurial streak and wanted to kind of, kind of do my own thing. Uh, like so many people read the four hour work week uh, by Tim Ferriss yeah. and kind of gave me a bit of impetus in a couple of kind of key areas. Some things really resonated from that. And I'd been looking around for, for an idea, for an option for a while. Uh, I actually ran a indoor, I launched and ran an interview coaching business uh, for about a year and a half, trying to actually help people get jobs through making better interviews, uh, which went well, but could, was a struggle to scale. Mm. From that, I pivoted into uh, actually helping the businesses to hire. So I was working with some remote businesses, uh, kind of online businesses, you know, small to kind of medium sized companies, everything from, you know, Amazon FBA uh, companies to uh, SEO agencies, dev shops, all kinds of things, uh, helping them to figure out how they should hire, how they should manage their teams. And uh, JobRack actually came up for sale. So JobRack had been running for a few years mm-hmm. and uh, the guys that were running it had, it was a bit of a side hustle for them. And uh, yeah, they were going to uh, either kind of close it down or sell it. It was really, really kind of just perfect sweet spot for me. Tech stack was in place. It was nice and small. So there's tons and tons of opportunity and uh, it was niche down. So JobRack is entirely focused on helping people hire really great people from Eastern Europe. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's kind of jumped in and uh, it's been a, a kind of a wild ride for the, for the three years since then and, and continues to be. So it's interesting with you know, European because I sort of pivoted into that kind of at, um, employment range. So my guy, my main program lives in the UK. Um, I've got another guy that's in the Ukraine that works for me. And what we just, what I discovered was that Europeans are like traditionally do speak reasonably decent English. They don't want a big salary. They're not looking for big money because its salary is usually pretty competitive. And at the end of the day, too, they they're very well educated. Like they've gone to university and they've got a fairly stable internet connection and stuff like that. And I think that's, it's kind of the forgotten area. I think, you know, like mm. once I discovered European, I thought, oh, that's not so bad. Like they, you know, they speak pretty good English and they, they sort of, you know, they, they, they're they educated. So I thought that was quite an interesting thing that, you know, most of the other side of the world is probably sort of focused on employing out of India and Bangladesh and all those other countries. But the, the language barrier is pretty, pretty high there in some cases. Yeah, definitely. Eastern Europe is just uh, a sweet spot and not a week goes by that I don't kind of find something else 
um, that kind of just just amazes me either in kind of skills or level of education. Um, and, and one of the things, I mean, Eastern Europe for us is like 22 countries or so. Mm-hmm. And there's probably like six or seven that we really, really focus on. I've got the absolute sweet spot of that, like you mentioned, that technical education. Um, you know, oftentimes we're seeing not one university degree, but two university degrees. Really, really great English. Uh, and the thing that, and again, you know, we kind of have to talk in some general stereotypes, but uh, as difficult as that is, it's just true. The work ethic is just off the charts. Um, generally, you know, the, the kind of people from these countries, they've had some harder times. The local salaries have tend to be extremely, extremely low, mm. which means that when they work remotely for, for businesses like ours or businesses that I work with, then, you know, they can be earning a really good salary, but the business owner is still paying maybe 50% of what they would if it was in the US, you know, Australia, Canada, uh, the UK, et cetera. So, you know, huge opportunities. And like you said, they're really happy because, you know, they're getting a great job. They're mm-hmm. getting a really good salary for them. Um, and yeah, just the output and what they deliver and just their approach is, is just great. And without the sense of kind of the sense of entitlement uh, that sometimes we're seeing an awful lot of in the, in the Western world from uh, yes. perhaps the, you know, yeah. kind of uh, younger people today kind of looking through and working. And I say that as a relatively young person myself, that mm. it's a source of eternal frustration. And that's, yeah, that's why it's so refreshing and awesome working with people from Eastern Europe. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Like, uh, I think that the biggest problem in the generation, like in, in, with Sydney, with um, with a recent lockdown, we've got a scenario, scenario where I noticed on Facebook, there were some employers complaining that their staff actually wanted them to make them stay home and not work so they could claim money off the government and not actually do anything. Because <laughs> the government started to say, "Well, stay home and, and we'll pay you." It's like, "Well, hang in a minute. That's it's, it's, you know, they're not educating them very well in terms of work ethic." Because you basically are saying, "Well, it's just you know, stay home. We'll pay you money and we'll, you'll do it for free. You know, you won't have to do any work." Yeah, yeah. yeah we've had the same in the UK with um, you know where we've you know, some companies are fur- we call it furlough over here. Yeah. Um, where they're furloughed, so they're they're staying home and they're not working. But some other you know in the in the same team perhaps you know you still need to keep the business running. So some of them are going to work. And so the ones that are going to work, some of them were kind of like, well, hang on a minute, I could be sat at home not working and getting the same money. Um, but actually, when the weather's good, that can as was a frustration last year. But then actually, people realise there's only so much Netflix they can watch. There's only so much gardening they can do. Actually, most, you know, the kind of the good people, they want to be in work. Um, yeah. But yeah, it makes for, like I said, tricky around the work ethics side of things. Yeah, so it's interesting. So, um, and I guess the, the whole outsourcing thing is probably, to me, still infancy. Like, I, I see... Um, you know, I've probably been doing it, I don't know, maybe 15 years now, maybe longer. And, and look at some people, they've never employed an out, an outsourced person before or they've had a bad experience with it and then they don't want to do it again. And I think, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the biggest mistake is that people don't follow the same process you would if you're employing a person face-to-face, right? Yeah, definitely. It's, you know, hiring is hard, ultimately. And whether you are you know, outsourcing one task through, you know, Fiverr or Upwork or something like that, um, or whether you're hiring someone for the long term, you've got to put the right amount of effort in. It's not, it's not easy and it shouldn't be easy because it's going to make a massive difference to you. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's definitely a key thing around, you know, making sure you figure out what it is you actually want, um, being really clear about what you want yep. and then figuring out the right ways to get it. And, and that's exactly what I spend a lot of my time kind of jumping on calls with entrepreneurs, with business owners, uh, and just kind of helping them figure that stuff out. Uh, and that's and for me, that's like really good fun because it, it's having kind of calls with interesting people, with interesting businesses, and helping them figure out these kind of uh, kind of problems and what the solutions are. And then if that's right for us at JobRack to help them hire, then great. If not, then no worries. Uh, but that's, yeah, the most important thing is just figuring out, saying, what, you know, what's right? What do you need? Um, and you're right. I think... You know, globally, obviously, the whole world has just discovered remote work in a way that, you know, previously, maybe it was a bit of a niche, you know, maybe it was 5% or 2% of the world. Uh, online businesses have been, you know, lots have been working remotely for, for years now, hiring remote teams, but it was still the minority by a long, long way. Now, what we're seeing is, you know, kind of the average, uh, average company uh, is waking up and going, huh, I don't need to hire locally, because if they're going to be sat at home working remotely, then they could be sat in a different state or in a different country or in a different continent. Mm-hmm. And suddenly you kind of can leverage opportunities to hire, you know, potentially people with different or better skills, um, different or better education, different kind of uh, infrastructure, you know, and kind of um, opportunities there um, and at a different cost base, which, you know, we have to be careful. It's not about, you know, offshoring jobs necessarily. Mm-hmm. Most of what kind of we help people do is actually we're helping businesses to hire earlier than they could otherwise afford to hire locally or to hire skills that they can't get locally. Um, and then in the future, they might, you know, 
kind of bring some kind of jobs back locally, locally and kind of onshore. Oftentimes that doesn't happen because, you know, when you're scaling really successfully in a particular part of the world and you're paying kind of a certain cost base and their people are great, then why would you not continue to, to do more of it? Um, but a lot of the times that, yeah, we start kind of helping people hire earlier than, than they otherwise could. And so the interesting thing when we had remote workers was that um, paranoia, particularly, it's not so much for remote workers because they're kind of used to it, but what I noticed was that if I sent a worker home, and this would happen probably would, would happen with COVID and sending people home, they get paranoid because what they start doing is thinking everybody's against them because they don't see what's going on in the business as a whole. They can't see the boss working. They can't see other employees. There's no chit-chat going on necessarily. And so what happens is they start getting all sort of upset about things that aren't really real and then they start getting into a bad situation and then they just you know fulfills and that you know destiny fulfills itself because they get fired because they become a bad employee and and i think that in remote work they're used to that so it's almost like they don't really care right they don't really care about what's going on in that situation because they're not they don't have that connection to the people that work with them but i think it's really important to realize that if you don't build that connection with the with the remote workers exactly the same way as you do with a normal worker You'll either lose them or they will, you know, lose interest in what's going on because it's like they're human, right? Yeah, definitely. You, you got to be really intentional. And so, you know, for me, whether it's a freelancer doing kind of, you know, a couple of tasks for me, uh, I still want them to be kind of engaged. And I still want to be really open and kind of talk about what we're doing. But especially with team members, it's crucial. And you have to be you have to put more effort in. You know, when you have a new person starting for you and you're doing the onboarding process, for instance, if they're remote, you've got to be way more intentional about it because they're not going to just casually stop by your desk. Mm. You're not going to go for lunch with them. You're not going to grab a coffee with them in the morning. So you have to be a lot more intentional about booking and spending time with them uh, and making sure they feel like part of that team and doing things like, you know, lots and lots of businesses use Slack or Teams or, you know, Messenger of very various kinds, you know, to have that kind of chit chat mm. uh, and to kind of let help people get to know each other. And so, but yeah, being remote, you have to be a bit more intentional about it, but you can definitely do it. And there's some great companies, I think, you know, job here at JobRack kind of, we work hard at that, mm -hmm. uh, creating really good kind of like, just kind of team links. One of the simple things that I do is I, I have all of my team and I do it myself. You know, when we start work, whether it's in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, doesn't matter, because uh, we're kind of reasonably flexible. We have some core hours, but we always say good morning or we say hello in the Slack mm -hmm. chat. Yep. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? What was your weekend like? Um, I will post little videos, you know, as I'm walking into whichever office I'm working from that day. And um, I'll post a little video, you know, saying, hey, guys, what's going on? And we do little things like that. We share what we're listening to music wise, uh, what we're working on, little wins we've had to keep that kind of or to build that kind of real kind of team morale and just getting to know each other as people. Because that's what you know, you're right. That's what builds a culture. That's what builds a really successful business, having, you know, engaged people. Yeah, it's quite interesting because I what I do because I've still got a fairly small team and every so often and it's almost like it's it's natural now. I used to do it when I had staff. I'd just drop into their desk and you'd have this casual conversation and, and I'd do it regularly so I make sure I got around everyone because I had twenty three staff at one point. Yeah. And now what I do is I just start a you start a chat conversation and start talking about personal stuff and what's going on and that makes a massive difference. You can almost see the peak of the work pick up the next week out of a result of that little casual conversation you have. But it's really easy to forget about them because you don't see them. And so you just don't think about it. And and I think that's a, the danger in any remote working environment, particularly with when you're taking on someone new as well, because they don't want they want to feel connected to the business. They don't want to feel like you, you know, there's some sort of, you know, third party coming in not doing you know, not involved. So mm. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, like you said, just got to be intentional about it. And there's lots of things you can do from, you know, team meetings, the one to ones, you know, virtual retreats. Uh, in-person retreats once we eventually kind of can get back to kind of being able to travel a little bit easier. Uh, but yeah, the key thing is just be intentional about it and, you know, treat people like the long-term team members and, you know, ultimately almost kind of like friends that, that you want them to be. So was, one of the things I noticed with the Philippines um, staff that I've had was that over there, if you do something wrong or you ask questions, then that's something that, that that's basically frowned upon. And, mm -hmm. and they're basically kind of saying, well, you know, so what happens is you'll have, a, they'll stop doing something and then you wait three or four days and say, how are you going with that? And you come back, so I couldn't figure it out. So why did you ask me three days ago that you couldn't figure it out? Why did you leave it till now? But culturally, it's it's bad face for them to be able to have to admit they don't know what they're, they're doing. Um, and I and the first thing I do with them is I you know, train them on that straight away. It's like, you've got to get beyond that. Is there sort of incursincrasies with the European market that's similar to that? or? 
No, and that's one of the kind of the standout things and why we get a lot of people uh, coming to Eastern Europe um, having had kind of similar experiences. And, and I want to couch this by saying, you know, there are some amazing people that you can hire from, from all over the world. Mm. Um, I've hired in, you know, from kind of all of the kind of key areas of Philippines, India, um, South Africa, Latin America. And, you know, my focus obviously now is Eastern Europe. And <clears throat> what we find in, in Eastern Europe is that they are very direct with their communication style. Mm. Mm. So if they think something's not clear, they're going to tell you. Mm. If they think you're wrong or something could be better, they're going to tell you. Mm. And they'll do it in quite a, or I'm going to say direct, but almost brash manner. Yeah. So to us kind of soft yeah. Westerners, as it yeah. were, initially it can be a bit like, ooh, that's a bit, that's a bit strong. Um, and then you get used to it and then you go, oh, this is amazing. And it is incredibly refreshing. Mm. Uh, and it's, you know, again, it's a, kind of a cultural thing. They, they're just much straighter talking. Um, yeah. They don't have a, much of Eastern Europe, for instance, doesn't have a lot of the kind of sensitivities, I guess, mm. um, that, you know, we do often do in the Western world. And that's for the good and bad, you know, so that they, mm. they are certainly behind on kind of legislation around kind of equality and things like that. And that's that's building up a lot. Um, but definitely, yeah, culturally, they're very, very direct in their communication style. They will tell you, they will ask questions. And that is a huge, huge benefit. And so mm -hmm. as a result there, you just don't have that, the kind of that issue that you described there that you've mm -hmm. had before with them, um, kind of the Philippine team. And like I said, you can get some amazing people in the Philippines, but it, you certainly have to work a lot harder and kind of train them a lot harder to push mm -hmm. past those kind of the cultural those side of cultural things. Cultural things, yeah, because I think that's mm -hmm. what you've got to consider. It's like, well, it's interesting. I've got a Ukraine guy working for me at the moment, and and when he doesn't understand something, he says, can you rephrase that? Mm -hmm. Now, if you said that in Australia, you'd probably get yourself punched. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, man, what the hell? You're telling me something. Mm -hmm. it's like, But when you when you look at it, it's the same terms. If you look at it, think, well, hang on a minute. That's just the way he's, he's being direct. So I don't understand what you're talking about. He's not telling you that, but it's basically telling yeah. you that. But it's like, can you rephrase that? It's like, okay. So it's a very, you know, sort of straightforward way to tell you that you've, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, no, good. absolutely. And, and we see that a lot, you know, and um, what we also see is with kind of when you put people into kind of leadership or management positions, again, they're much kind of happier, I guess, and kind of much, uh, you know, really, really capable kind of to be very direct kind of with the teams, but also then take it upon themselves to be very clear in their instructions as well. And that's what as entrepreneurs and, and leaders and business owners, sometimes, you know, a, a, often the fault is with us and, you know, we'll give someone or delegate a task. We might just about know what it is we meant, but we might not have been very clear. Mm. Uh, and that is crucial. And you need people that will say, you know, like you said, can you rephrase that? Or what do you mean by that? Or flesh that out in a bit more detail so that they've got enough detail to then actually let them give you, you know, what it is you're actually after. Yeah. And I think that's the thing with small businesses that, you know, as, as a manager, if you think you know all the answers, then you've got a, you got a shot mm. coming <laughs> because um, yeah. some of the stuff that you think that's going to work the way you think is never going to work that way because people just don't understand it or, yeah, and you haven't explained it well. So I think, yeah, I mean, you've, you've got to be conscious of that. And, uh, yeah, it's probably a good thing that they'll tell you because I think that's the biggest thing. We've always, you know, trained on, like, if you've got a problem, tell us you've got a problem. Don't wait for me to find out because that could be bad for you. Right? Do you want simple and effective ways to get started that don't cost a fortune in time and money? Discover the best steps for each strategy we teach and the most important areas to focus on and even to connect with your best customers and grow an online community. Grab your free copy of Startup Secrets for Entrepreneurs at startupsecrets.show. No, exactly. And you just, it's just not something you want to worry about. Um, and the other kind of, one of the other kind of big things about Eastern Europe is, you know, they have no extreme of weather um, mm. and they have incredible infrastructure. Like, you know, one of my team's got a better internet connection than I have and she pays less than I do. Uh, and I'm in like central London and mm. I've got all the connectivity available to me. And that is something that, you know, all across Eastern Europe, their infrastructure and connectivity is absolutely amazing. And so that's just kind of one less thing, you know, power outages, internet outages are incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, and that kind of, you know, that makes a difference. You don't want to be worrying about whether, you know, your staff don't have problems because of, you know, a typhoon or things like that. So that, that and that is something you have to consider in kind of other other areas of the world. Mm. And so... Um... So when you took over the business, was it how big was it? Was it a did it have a fairly big infrastructure, or was it just a tiny? tiny no, it was absolutely tiny. So it had been kind of mothballed effectively. So it was still up and live um, for about nine or ten months uh, before I bought it. The guys had just kind of left it alone, reduced it to one dollar a job post just to stop scammers. Yeah. Um, so it was doing about fifteen dollars, one five dollars a month in revenue. Right. So okay. yeah, it was literally 
sunset mode. Mm. Uh, and so we, but it had, you know, it had kind of good people using it, it had jobs being listed, it had a good database of job seekers. And so it was a, almost a, let's restart the engines mm. um, and then build out from there, which we've done, you know, we've done very, very rapidly. Uh, big, big focus on the quality. And that's what we look for. You know, there, there are some hiring sites out there that you can go to that you can post a job and you can get hundreds of applicants. And then you are you are faced with that deluge of hundreds of applicants to then review their CVs and their resumes and their profiles and things like that, which is hugely painful. And I'm, I've mm-hmm. never met a business owner yet that wants to review hundreds I'm of applicants. Not being there. Um, we, yeah, exactly. We, we take a different approach to it. What we're looking for is we want to give you a, sh- a smaller number but of quality applicants. And we work really, really hard on that. Um, and so that's our focus. So building up and, you know, my my entire strategy around growing the business is be helpful and friendly. Mm-hmm. And that's what's working really well. So like I mentioned, I jump on calls with people, kind of I'm helping them out. And it's about being very accessible. Uh, so, you know, as the owner of the business, you know, I jump on calls with people, you know, very, uh, probably three or four a day on average. Um, I've got my team, they do exactly the same. So, you know, we help people at every stage. And that's actually, you know, in the last kind of eight months or so has actually pivoted into us actually, you know, doing hiring services. We were getting a lot of people coming to us saying, hey, look, we get we can post a job board and a job post and that you're going to help us. But actually, we want you to do it for us. So, you know, how can you help us? Because it's, you know, some of the, a lot of it is it's hard and uh, it takes a lot of effort. You know, on average, it's probably around 40 to 60 hours of effort to, to hire a hire a role, whether that's a, a virtual assistant just to help you out and take tasks off your list. Or it's a you know senior level kind of manager to take on tasks in your business uh, and run a, a function or a department, um, or it's you know a developer to kind of you know develop and kind of push your tech stack and your your site forwards. Um, and so that's been a really interesting pivot for us. So from you know a conventional job board that is you know money while you sleep, although you know we did still work hard for it, mm. now into actual services where we are you know it's people, it's us doing the things for people. Uh, whether it's the hard things that they don't want to do, you know, sifting CVs and reviewing and shortlisting for them, um, all the things that they can't do. So one of the things that we focus a lot on right now is actual sourcing of candidates, because there's some roles right now, or a lot of roles right now that are in hot demand, right? Mm. With the, the shift to remote work and so many com- companies out there now looking for remote people. Um, if you want, like, let's say a senior JavaScript developer, or to be honest, a senior developer of any kind, these guys and girls are not hanging out on job boards, right? They don't need to because they're oh, in such hot demand. Yeah, nice. So we have to, we got to go and find them. We have to hunt them out. And so that's something that people are really appreciating that we can now do for them as part of our kind of done with you and done for you services. So it, that's been an interesting, interesting shift in the business from yeah, kind of conventional job board into kind of hiring services. So it's interesting. I, well, I went to a presentation years ago and one of the, the pieces of advice ever came out of this guy was, if you're a high touch business, you know, go low tech. Well, go tech, right? Mm. So do a lot of tech stuff. If you're high touch, go tech. If you're high tech, go low touch. You know, go high touch. And sort of that's kind of what you've done. Like you're a tech business mm. at the end of the day, but you've gone high touch. And that that's a great way to kind of grow your business because you're actually people want that. If they're coming even though you think they don't. You know, you realize that that's what they want. And the other thing I thought was quite smart on your website, which a lot of people don't realize, is that when you give people options, just give them three. Don't give them two. Don't, you know what I mean? Like give them three options. It always seems to work the best. And it's surprising most people then go to the biggest option automatically. Yeah. It's almost like if we had a launch of a product years and years ago where we had a basic level and a premium level and eventually we put one in between called standard. But when we started, we, we thought we'll sell 10 or 20% premium and all the rest will be mm-hmm. basic. You know, It was the other way around almost. Like you've always found that people would migrate to the more expensive option, which is if you didn't have one, then you're almost leaving money on the table because it was like people wanted it and people will pay for extra if you give them the option. Yeah, definitely. And I think, and in our, there's loads of really fascinating psychology around pricing and around, mm. you know, there's experiments been done around how you price an online course, for instance. Mm. And someone did an experiment selling the same course at $9, $99 and $999. And they actually sold more units at $999 than they did at either of the other two prices mm. because there's not many courses that are nearly $1,000. Yeah. And so it conveys value. It suggests that it's going to be really good. And in this case, it was it was a very, very kind of uh, really, really strong course. And it's similar. It's, there's a piece about how can you you know set yourself out to be premium. And, and that's always been important for me. I want to be delivering a premium service. I want to be delivering a good result. And I kind of want to get paid fairly for it, right? I'm not in this, I'm not a charity. I am looking to make money, but I want to, you know, 
have a good time doing it and kind of, you know, end up with kind of customers that are really, really happy. 80, what are we up to? I think about 85% of our customers right now come from referrals. Mm. So, you know, that means that we've got so many happy customers that are then letting their friends and people they know, know and say, hey, you should go and hire on JobRack because Noel and the team gave us a great service. And that literally every day people are coming to us in that way, which is amazing. Mm. And I really love it because that that's for me is the sign of success. And it's like, let's do a great job. Let's wow the customers and, you know, work that way. And that also keeps the impetus, makes us keep our quality levels really, really high. And, and I don't want to compromise on that because I want to be proud of, uh, of what we do. And, um, but yeah, it does make it interesting in terms of the offers. Uh, you know, I've got like a mountain analogy that's about to go live on the website. You know, it is ultimately, it's about, you know, hiring's hard. It's like climbing a mountain. You mm-hmm. just want to get to the top and, uh, you know, take a picture. And so we've got that kind of, you know, the do it yourself, you shoulder your own backpack type option. Um, you know, at the low end, $199, but you put lots of time and effort in yourselves. Um, we've got the top end option, which is the helicopter to the top of the mountain. Um, which everyone likes the idea of a helicopter, but obviously mm. it's super premium. It's, it's mm. the most expensive. And then there's that kind of mid-level option, which is the, you know, will be your mountain guide or, and your Sherpas and your team. And so, you know, we'll shoulder the backpacks, we'll guide you up the way um, and kind of make it as, as kind of easy as we can. And, <laughs> exactly yeah. that. We carry the gear, we do the hard work, find yeah. the route, help you avoid the pitfalls. And, uh, and that's the one that kind of works really, really well. But yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of three. So yeah, for any kind of listeners out there kind of thinking about their pricing table or their options, Big fan of always having three. Uh, in a previous business that I ran in my interview coaching business, I added on a more expensive option. Uh, I'd read something that basically says, uh, if you have a more expensive option, it makes the others look you know, more cost effective. Mm-hmm. And I tried it out and I put one on there and I never, ever, ever expected anyone to buy it. And then someone did. And mm-hmm. it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> now you need a more expensive option. <laughs> And it's really, really interesting. But, you know, as long as it's not, you know, I remember the days in the like in the Apple app store, right? You know, people have put an app in there for like $10,000. Mm. and Someone would still click buy on it. It's still got to be worth it, right? I, yeah. I don't uh, at all kind of like, you know, recommend people just put a crazy big price on something that's not worth it because you mm. always want to be delivering value uh, and feeling good about what you're doing. But uh, yeah, there's definitely lots of opportunity. Someone out there will want the super premium thing. Mm. And what I'm really discovering is that people want to work with people and there are so many faceless organizations out there, you know, Upwork, Fiverr, as soon as a company gets big, then where's the face behind it? Who can you actually speak to? Who can you pick up the phone to or jump on a call with? And that for me is, you know, I think it's a huge opportunity in it um, and it's fun as well. And it's really, really good fun. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And I think at the end of the day, like it's, it was, I've, I've had a recent experience with Upwork where I stupidly paid this guy too, too early in the deal and turned out this guy was a scammer. And mm. basically, and it cost me $4,000. Like, it was, like I'm still nasty about it because I've been doing it for a long time. I should have never fell for it. But it just like got away from me because I was busy. And when I spoke to Upwork about it, they basically said, well, you know, too bad for you. Um, you know, and I thought, well, isn't your job to qualify these people? Mm. And it's like, no, no, we just take the money. We just do a transaction. We're just transactional people, right? And I thought, okay. So you, you bought it yourself down to a transactional relationship um, that you kept 30% off, by the way. So you kept mm. 30 so, so are you actually taking stolen money here now? Like, <laughs> and it's like, and they said, oh, well, you know, we, it, we'll, we'll help with any legal stuff that you need to do, whatever. But they just wanted out of it. And I thought to myself, mm. so you never validated them. You never checked on who they were. And as soon as there was a problem, you didn't you kept your commission as well, and and it was clear this guy was actually you know scamming the system, mm-hmm. and they 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 took him off within a couple of days later anyway, and I thought to myself, well there you go, you became a transactional business, and as soon as you become a transactional business, that's when you've got a problem because now you now you are a faceless organisation because you're just built on transactions, and that told me a lot about them, when they didn't mean to say that. Yeah. Right. And, and it's like, yeah, sometimes, you know, what you do and what you say can be very different. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, like, and I mean, yeah, terrible experience there. And it is, I mean, it is hard for all kind of hiring sites. There's, you know, there's so far we can go. And we actually, you know, we have kind of government ID, so passport or driver's license. We uh, ask our job seekers to submit. And we probably had about 80% of our profiles kind of verified in that way. So at least there, you know, we've had some ID. Um it's always kind of, you know, on the employer to kind of figure those things out. But the difference, I'm, I'm kind of surprised with Upwork there because, you know, I would have expected because of the fees and the commissions they're taking, I mean, I'm glad they've removed his profile. Mm. Um, but I would have expected them to, 
you know, kind of do some compensation there, kind of and yeah. come back to you on that. It's, it's an interesting model and, and something that people often don't realize. So Upwork can at first appear to be, you know, really cost effective. It can be very cheap to get going. You know, there's no upfront fees. But when you look at the commission they're taking, not just from you, but also from the other the, the kind of yeah, yeah. The person doing the task or the job seeker, you know, it can be 30 percent or even more. So, you know, if you actually hire a person from there for a bigger project or a longer term, it can rack up into kind of four and five figures in terms of fees mm-hmm. over, over not a crazy long period. And, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of important that people are aware of that. Because yeah, I would have spent, I think I've spent about $150,000 on Upwork over mm-hmm. the years. And and this guy had the audacity to go and put a one-star review against me as well, which I went back to Upwork and said, hey, dude, that'd be... They said, oh, that's unfair. We'll take that off. But did I mean, like, it was almost like, yeah. It's, and I think that the thing with likes of Upwork is, is, and a lot of these other platforms, if they take on your job and your and they work for you, theirs that stay on Upwork for something like 18 months. You can't hire them outside Upwork. Um, I think Fiverr's might be a similar thing. And so if they do, they'll get taken off that platform. And so there's a risk factor there that you, you are, yeah, you're paying a lot of fees for a long time. And people don't think about that when it comes up front. And I mean, I had a guy that I spoke to about it and, 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 and he said, well, I, you know, I like to stay on Upwork. I want to stay there. I said, okay, fair enough. I said, but the fees are expensive. And he said, well, uh, he decided to discount his rates a little bit to compensate for some of the fees because he wanted to stay on the platform because he wanted to keep his credibility. And I think that was a fairly honourable thing to do. Um, I don't know whether he actually going to get rewarded for that, but anyway, at the end of the day, like he would, so it's a good indication of the, of the guy's very loyal. To me, mm. it was a good thing because now he proved to, to as an employee that he was quite loyal. And and I think and the other thing I've always done with employed people is I had this rule in my business. I used to tell them this to start. If I email you, and that was way before much of them doing messaging when I used to do that. If I emailed you and you didn't respond back, I assume you didn't work for me anymore. And they'd look at me and they'd go, I'm serious here. If you don't email me back, I assume you don't work for me anymore. And I think that's the situation with this is that when we employ, we look for responsiveness. If they're responsive and come back to you quickly, bearing in mind, you know, time zones. But if they come back to you and and I I used to ask them, you know, basic questions, see if they'd respond. And I found that the ones that just didn't bother to come back to you at all or came back really late, that's the way they're they're working before they get the job. What are they going to be like when they employ them? Exactly. Yeah, it's a, they're, they're clear, kind of clear warning signals there for yeah. uh, to look at. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah. So where's where's the future look for you now? What's your what's what's new goals for the next say twelve months of, with the platform? Is it to, to grow exponentially? So, Is grow. it back over the world? Yeah. Like <laughs> massive. <clears throat> massive growth so keep relentless focus on eastern europe that is our as much as there's a few other interesting areas of the world um i think eastern europe has got huge huge potential so we have 5x our revenue uh, in the last six months um as a result of kind of the shift from you know not just job posts but to these hiring services um ultimately be keep being helpful and friendly uh keep chatting to people helping people out and it, it kind of then just comes kind of comes full circle sometimes people end up hiring with us Sometimes it's not right for them, and I'm always, you know, super open and tell them that. Um, but yeah, more growth. I kind of, I've, I've got a vision of where Jobrack will be in a, in around about a year, year and a half's time. Um, how much time I'll be putting into it? So, you know, I'm hiring like my crazy at the moment for my own uh, role. So I've got a hiring an operations manager. Uh, we've got some sales and mark kind of marketing help kind of coming in. Um, but mainly around kind of the recruitment and sourcing. I, I want to make sure we're doing a really, really great job helping people hire. You know, great people, but like long-term team members. That's that's what we're about, finding people, whether it's part-time or full-time, but long-term committed team members um, and just and growing the business, but having a good time doing it, you know, building a really good team that, you know, wows our customers and really, really does a good, really great job and um, and enjoying it along the way. You know, I kind of, I, people often talk about, you know, work-life balance, et cetera. I'm not an 80-hour-a-week entrepreneur. That's not my bag. Uh, well, I am, but not on the work, not on work. Uh, I want to be having fun. I want to enjoy, you know, the weeks and the Otherwise, weekends. What's and, the point? Uh, right? what's well, the exactly point? that, right? Yeah. Exactly that. And so I'm very fortunate and I really enjoy what I do and so the calls and, um, you know, when I'm chatting to people, it, that's really enjoyable anyway. Uh, but yeah, it's also, it's about a life kind of piece, you know, what's the actual life that you want. And one of the things that I really enjoy is that when we're helping people to hire really, really commonly, we're actually helping them get the life that they want as well, because we're helping them you know, if it's a virtual assistant or an executive assistant, you know, it's taking stuff off their plate, maybe so that they can do more work or more mm-hmm. higher value work, but also sometimes so they can spend more time not working. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is, you know, really, really rewarding for me. So, yeah, for me, it's all about growth, growth and systems um, that will help us scale and still keep that like, relentless focus on you know, really, really great quality uh, hires for, for our customers. 
No, that's awesome. And I think that's a great way to do it. And I think if nothing else, it's a great timing if nothing else, right? Like you've come into a marketplace where that's the world's not going to go back. People are not just going to reset back two years' time back to the normal. The world never go back to the same. So yeah, I think the remote definitely. work is here to stay. And, and a lot of businesses have realized that and don't want them to come back in the office. Like it's almost like, you know, don't, you know, why would I spend expensive rent space when these people can obviously do the work from home, which I didn't think that they could, but now I realize they can. <laughs> yeah, they can do it. And then again, you know, people are looking at kind of time zones and saying, well, how can I get a bit of like kind of arbitrage about the time zone? So how can I, you know, still have some crossover so I can still be talking with the team? Um, and that's where Eastern Europe's great in that sense, you know, really compatible with the US, really compatible, you know, we can still get a few hours crossover with uh, kind of people in Australia as well. And then, you know, kind of, you know, you've got enough hours kind of to be doing team meetings and kind of setting the work and having conversations and chit chat, but then they're cracking on while you're asleep, basically. Um, and then kind of, you know, the delivery's ready for the next day. So it's yeah, nice when you really wake up in the morning and the program has said, okay, I've done this, then this, this, now it's time for you to check it, right? And then you can spend yeah. your day you know, luxuriating in the fact that they're asleep. So it's not like you have to get anything else done. No pressure. Yeah, no exactly pressure. that. I think it's a great way to go. Like, I quite like the whole time zone thing. <laughs> like, you know, because yeah. otherwise you've got that eight-hour day, work day that's focused on everybody working. And sometimes that means that you are going to miss things and then they're, they're mm. going to not work as hard at something that they could have if they'd had a bit more time for it. So, mm. Yeah, no, staggering it can be, uh, can be great. All right. So, um, so they can go to jobrack.eu, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, jobrack.eu is the main site. So if you're interested in kind of hiring or getting any help, then um, head on over to the site and check us out. Uh, if you want to uh, kind of get in touch with me, um, then head to Connect with Noel. So that's Connect with N O E L dot com, um, and that will uh, kind of take to, to some information there. And uh, feel free if anyone wants to kind of book a call, chat about hiring, get any help with um, kind of hiring remote workers, then um, they can click uh, click through from yeah, Connect with Noel dot com. That's nice. Great. Cool. We'll put the links up in there in case anybody didn't pay attention to that. Um, and so they, they want to click on it later. So I really appreciate your time. It's a, a great work subject and I think it's very timely. Um, and I really, really appreciate your time and, and uh, your knowledge in this. Hey, no worries, John. Been really, really good chat. That's a wrap on another awesome episode for the Startup Secret Show for Nippernors. Just before you go, if you like this episode, we'd be very grateful for a five-star review. Please also consider recommending the show to a friend or two. Make sure you subscribe for future episodes at StartupSecrets.show right now. Until next time, if you're an entrepreneur, make a start on your next great business idea today.